Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Ward. I'm just administering this webinar today. So um, if you've got any questions, feel free to use the question box. We'll just give it a couple more minutes to see if we get some more attendees. Hi, Sue. I see you've got your hand up. Have you got a question? Hi Yvette, I see you've got your hand raised. Um, if you've got a question, can you use the question box, please? We're just going to give it probably another minute and then we'll begin. Okay, we've got the majority of our attendees here now, so we're just going to get underway. Just a bit of housekeeping to begin with. Um, if you have a question, just type it into the question box, and we can see that at our end, and we'll do our best to address them as we go. Okay, so welcome to today's webinar on End of Financial Year Processing. My name is Sarah Ward, and I'll be going through the standard practice for processing the end of the financial year, along with some of the reports that you can run to check the health of your debtors, creditors, and GST. A lot of what we're going through today will cover a standard end of month process, but getting that right is an important part of getting the end of year process correct. Right, so getting underway. The first thing that we're going to do is make sure that all the debtor banking batches have been processed and that all the available transactions have been posted through to the ledgers. So to do that, we go to sales and we're going to check our debtor banking batches. I have the graphical menus installed on this version of EXO, so I can just click the button here and it brings it up. If you don't have graphical menus, you can access your debtor banking batches under the transactions drop-down, debtor receipts, and debtor's banking batches. So in here, I'm just going to go new and generate a new banking batch. You can see that um, we've got one transaction available here, a cash sale, and 
for the Auckland branch. If you have multiple branches, these do have to be processed individually and you can just select which relevant branch you're looking at through the drop down there. So we've only got a transaction for Auckland, so I'm just going to double click on it and that brings it down here into our batch section. So that means that when we post this, anything in this bottom box is going to get posted through against your debtors. So once we're happy with all of the transactions that we've got batched here, we're going to lock and then we're going to mark it ready to post. Once you mark it at ready to post, we have this post to GL button becomes available and we can just simply click on it, go through and confirm the transaction date, the age and um, if we just want to put my initials there and the bank account that it's being processed against. So we go OK and yes we do want to post and confirm that there and that's that's debtor banking batches cleaned up. Now what we find is that um, most people don't use debtor banking batches to process their debtor receipts but in here if you ever lose a debtor transaction so you know that you've processed a receipt against a debtor account and you can't find it in your bank reconciliation and it's not showing as available to post in the ledger posting options, have a look in the debtor banking batches. Um, this, is, this is generally where they end up if, they've, if they haven't been processed properly or they've, um, the process has errored part way through and you're not sure where that transaction's gone, that debtor banking batches is probably the first place that you should look. Okay, so we've taken care of that now and the next one we're going to do is we're actually going to post our ledgers to our GL. Again, I'm using the graphical menu options and I've got this button here, post ledgers to GL, and that brings up a screen that most of you will be familiar with. But if you don't have the graphical menus installed, utilities, ledger postings, post ledgers to GL. First thing you want to look at is to make sure that you've got ticks in all these boxes. These are the ledgers that we're posting. You can post them independently of each other, but it's usually a good idea to make sure that everything comes through at once. Now, one part of this screen you may not be familiar with is this option here. A lot of, a lot of businesses have this defaulted to a selected period range, and that defaults to the current period. Uh, there is just one small problem with that, is if you process a transaction while you're in March, but the transaction is dated February, it won't be posted using this option. So it's always a good idea to review your all unposted range. So bearing that in mind, we're just going to preview a post run now. And this just generates, we're not going to look at the report, this just generates the what the batch will be like and what the um, what what the journal essentially is going to be for this batch. The uh, preview, it doesn't post anything and it doesn't uh, change the status of any of your transactions. So previewing it is, is a really good option if you do have um, unposted transactions in prior periods. Give you an opportunity to see what they are and if you're not sure about them, you can close out of the screen pop back into your debtors or your creditors ledger and just review them to make sure that you're comfortable posting them through into the general ledger. Unposted debtor and creditor payments will not show on your bank reconciliation until they have been posted. So that is a pretty, it's a pretty good indication that you've got unposted transactions is if you know that you've processed a certain payment and it's not available in your bank reconciliation yet it's usually just sitting as an unposted. So we're happy with what we've got here. We've just got some March transactions, which are to be expected. So we are going to click on the button and generate a new GL post run. And we are sure we want to continue. And this is just creating these transactions that we've just previewed. And we're not gonna, run, we're not gonna print it, but yes, we're sure that we want to post. Okay, so the next step is, is a step that a few of you probably aren't familiar with um, and it is only available in newer versions of EXO. <clears throat> it, 
that we've got two reports here called Reconcile Receivables Account and Reconcile Payables Account. Now, th these reports are only on more recent versions of EXO and they're not available within the drop-down menus as a default, but it is pretty easy for us to add these reports either into a graphical menu for you or into a drop-down. So if you do want access to these reports and you can't find them, give us a call and we can sort you out with that. Okay, so we're just going to preview this one. Uh, it's the current period, so we're happy with that. Okay, so what this shows us is the value of transactions posted against individual debtor accounts compared to the balance of the debtor control account. Now, it, it may seem a bit... Um, illogical to you because you would assume that those will always be the same but it's it's not always the case if you process a general ledger journal directly against the debtor control account for the G, for the GL it will um, it will produce a transaction in here account balance but it will not change the value of receivables. So we don't recommend posting journals directly to control accounts and ordinarily that option will be turned off. We can see here though that we've just got a 46 cent variance in our debtors which is probably just due to rounding and it's, it's quite acceptable. If you do have a large variance you can scroll down um, foreign exchange is something that we do have to consider, but for simplicity's sake, we're not looking at it today. It's not affecting our reconciliation. We get this list of possible causes of exceptions, which are unposted transactions, unallocated deposits, erroneous payments and adjustments, direct posting, and suspended GL accounts. These, um, these are basically just here to tell you where to look to resolve this variance. Um, if, you've, if you run these reports and you're not 100% sure about um, what these mean or how to find them or, or process them, give us a call, call up support, send an email in, uh, whatever your preferred means of communication is, and we can go through this with you and help you to reconcile these. So that's the DERS one. We've got pretty much the identical report here for creditors. It does exactly the same thing. It compares our account balance from the general ledger to our balances within the individual creditor accounts. And it again gives us a list of possible causes of exceptions just here. So we don't have any exceptions, so we don't really need to, to look too closely at that. So we can close that down. The next thing you should check is your trial balance tree. The trial balance tree is available under Transactions, General Ledger, GL Trial Balance Tree. It's not available on the graphical menus, but it can be added. It's not, um, it's not a problem for us to edit those for you. So we open this up and we can see we're viewing our trial balance. We're using the account balances. Um, using sub-accounts is ticked on by default, and the branches are including all branches by default. Uh, if you wanted to take your, your trial balance at a period of, in time, then you change it to year to date and then you can change these options if you only wanted to view a particular branch or um, a, if you had multiple companies. This is just a demo database, so it's just, it only just has the one. But what you can see here is down in the bottom left, uh, bottom right, sorry, we've got out by zero dollars and zero cents, which means all debits in our system are the same as all the credits in our system, so they equal out as a proper double entry accounting system should. Um, depending on the age of your database and how many transactions you process, you could tolerate, I would say, up to about a $5 variance here, but once you start going over that, we sort of need to investigate what's causing that. So the possible causes of imbalances is uh, data integrity issues, and um, people posted one-sided journal entries. We've had a few people in the past figure out how to do that to um, make their lives a bit easier, but that just ends up making their lives a bit harder. But um, So we don't advise doing that, but it does happen, and um, we, we can fix these imbalances for you without um, affecting your data integrity. So that's just another important check to go through. Just prior to rolling the period, you want to make sure that everything's balanced before we go ahead and do that. So 
Now that we've checked and we've reconciled our debtors and our creditors and our trial balance is balanced, we are ready to roll our end of period. Again, I'm accessing via the graphical menu, but the drop-down menu is available under Utilities and End of Period. So we're in here, we can see our current period is March and the calendar year is 2016. You'll probably all be familiar with this. Um, you tick on the ledgers that you want to roll. Uh, it's always a good idea to roll them all together at once. We like, the system likes everything to be in the same period. It makes transacting easier and it protects your data integrity as well. The only difference is at the end of financial year, you simply tick that box there. And once you're happy with how everything looks, we simply roll the period. Now, the end of the financial year, sorry, just uh, again, we're just ignoring uh, foreign currency at the moment, um, so we'll just click yes. The end of the financial year has to be processed with a typical month end rollover. It can't be done independently, and it is really important that you, you do process these um, because of the effect that they have on your general ledger accounts. So this is just telling us that annual financial year ends in March 2017. We're happy with that because we know that our current one is March 2016. So we, we won't review the period's definition now, but um, I'll show you how to do that separately. So we've, we've posted and rolled and we're into the new financial year now. If you're not sure about what which financial year you're in, pop into Configurator, so that might be a separate icon or it's under Utilities, drop down. It's not in the drop down menu by default, but it is on the graphical menu here. So this launches a separate module and it brings up all the background stuff that we do. So if we tab over to Essential, and into financial year, this will tell you what your current financial year is. And because we've just rolled, we're in 2017. But if so, if you're not sure when it comes to processing in the financial year, pop in here and check, and that'll just let you know what financial year you're in. If you if you're not in the correct financial year, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> let us know and we can help get you up to speed on everything like that. So. Just briefly, what what the difference between a typical end of month rollover is and an end of financial year rollover is, is that um, the end of financial year takes the balances of your profit and loss accounts and it posts them through into what's called retained earnings and that's a balance sheet account. So after you process the end of financial year, if we just pop into our chart of accounts here and find our sales account, um, we see that now that we've processing in the financial year, our balance is zero. <clears throat> and that's all ready to start the, the new financial year fresh from a, 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 a blank starting point. And we can move forward, we can go into retained earnings here. So we've got a balance of 28,000. And you can see it here. This is this transaction here that's highlighted as our end of year profit and loss movement. And if we go here, you see it's valued at $289,000. So that's just, that's the key difference is that your, your profit and loss accounts will, um, they will go back to zero and it'll give you a blank starting point to start the new financial year. Um, we've just had a question. Um, someone's asking, how do you tell if an account is a profit and loss or whether it's a balance sheet account? Uh, that's pretty strip, that's pretty straightforward. Within your leisure account details, pop over to the details tab and in the section here, this is what shows you what it's classified as. So you can you've got a balance sheet or a profit and loss. Now you you can change that, but it's not advisable if there's if there's transactions in that account. You get this warning and it is not recommended that we proceed change it back and it does the same. So if you do have an account that you've set up and you've, you've made it a balance sheet item when it should have been a profit and loss item, the best way to deal with that is to create a completely new account from scratch that's got the right section setting 
and then journal the difference between the two accounts because um, changing these is one of the main causes of um, data imbalance in the trial balance tree and that's got to do with how we process our end of financial year. So are there any other questions at this stage? No, it doesn't look like there's any other questions. So we're just going to very briefly review rolling over the fixed asset module. Um, fixed assets is a <clears throat> additional module to EXO that requires its own separate rollover. Now it's the only one that does. If you have job costing or distribution advantage or any of those modules, they don't need to be rolled over separately. It is just fixed assets. And the key difference between the fixed assets end of year rollover and the EXO business end of year rollover is the ability to post transactions back. So you'll all be aware that if a period in EXO business is unlocked, then you can post transactions through to it and um, it, pr it processes them as you would expect. The difference to fixed assets is that you can't. So once you roll, and fixed assets, you cannot go back and post transactions anymore. Um, so that's why the fixed asset rollover will not, will not necessarily take place at the same time as your end of financial year rollover in EXO business. And that's just due to the fact that um, you have to wait till all your transactions are in. You have to get all your asset sales and purchases and depreciation done before we can um, before we can do it. So. We'll start off here with a calculate depreciation. We're just going to set that back to March and we'll calculate. Does our calculation on the basis of our values and shows us what the new values are going to be. So we'll post that. We're not going to print a list. And <clears throat> that's that done. So at this point we're going to say we're happy that all our transactions have been posted and we're going to do our rollover. So again, really straightforward run end of year and it just completes it just like that. So that's just the, the biggest thing to be aware of with fixed assets is that once you're rolled you cannot post anything back into the prior period. So um, if you do have fixed assets and you've got any questions give us a call and um, we can talk you through everything that you'll need to know before you do your fixed assets rollover. Okay. Yes, I'm sure I want to close that. So the final thing we're going to touch on very, very briefly is a GST reconciliation. Now, EXO doesn't have a native GST reconciliation process, but you have all the data available to you. So it is something that you can do just to check. <clears throat> I've worked in accounting firms for 10 years before I started at Focus, and we always found that the GST reconciliation um, could become one of the more time-consuming things that we had to do before we could finalise end of financial year accounts. So any work that you do reconciling your GST um, should make the analysis easier for your end of financial year accountant and then hopefully that will translate into lower accounting fees from the external accountant. Um, obviously in a perfect world we would... Um, we would know that the balance of our GST account as at the 31st of March 2016 would be the value of the GST return for that period. But we obviously we don't very often work in a perfect world scenario, so we can't really say that. What I've done is I've made a wee dummy spreadsheet here. It's a wee mock-up of what a, a GST reconciliation would be like. We've got our returns here on the left, we've got the effect that these would have on our general ledger and then we've got the reconciliation back here. So this this top section is reconciling um, payments made to the IRD back to the returns. The most important thing we reconcile is our GST account balance, so this is the GL balance and we reconcile that back to the value of the return. So you can see here the value of the returns is 53,750. We've got 53,750 here, and that's confirmed by subtracting the, the value of expenses 
back off the value of income. Um, we can do a wee test and say change the balance of the GL account and you see that while these changed here, sorry here and here, these balances didn't. So that's how we know that we've got it right is we've we can change our balance, but our reconciliation remains reconciled. So um, if you are interested in working through this little GS2 reconciliation process, uh, feel free to give us a call at Focus and we can talk you through this. We can make this template available to you and, and you, can, um, you can just put your numbers into it and it will show you whether or not it's reconciled. Obviously, um, this is a perfect world scenario and you're not always going to have, um, you know, complete 100% reconciliation like this, but what it does is it gives you a good indication of whether you're missing anything or whether there's been any problems. If you've got a large variance, obviously that's a, an indication we need to have a further look at things. But I'm not going to go into too much detail about it today because we, um, I could probably spend an hour talking about it and we just don't have time for that today. So we're going to wrap it up there and we've got, time, we've got some time for questions now if anyone's got any questions about anything we talked about. And um, oh yeah, so I'll open it up to the floor. Hi Grant, yep, um, I can give you a copy of the spreadsheet, that's not a problem. If you want to contact me after the webinar, I can uh, send copies out to everyone. My email address is sarah.ward at focus.net.nz and uh, just flick me an email and I can send this out to you. Um, it doesn't have any instructions on it yet, but it's fairly self-explanatory. But then if you do have any questions, just let me know and I can uh, answer them as we go. <coughs> No other questions at this point. So yeah, just to, just to recap, um, there are a couple of reports here that we ran for the um, debtor and creditor reconciliation that you may not have on your menus by default. So if you do want those, just get in touch with support and we can add those into your menus. Um, they are only available for more recent versions of EXO, but we have actually written reconciliation reports for older versions of EXO as well. So if you're not sure, just let us know and uh, we, we can make these reports available to you and talk you through um, any variances that you might have or any questions you've got about how to use them. Okay, it doesn't look like we've got any more questions from the floor, so we might finish it off there and um, just remember that support desk is always available or if you've got questions that are related specifically to the GST reconciliation process, then you can give me a call or an email and I'll be available to help you out there. Okay, have, have a lovely afternoon and a safe Easter. Thank you.